All right, uh, next up we have Jonathan Liu, who's going to tell us about his project on the organized microphase separation of active spinner particles in dense colloidal solutions. Um, his mentors were Professor Alfredo Alexander Katz, as well as Mr. Ryan Tollefson. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. One of the most important elements in creating novel materials is the ability to manipulate that material structure at the nanoscale level. And one of the most promising approaches to this is by using self-assembly, where we can take an external influence, such as a magnetic field, apply that to a material structure, and then change that structure. And there's already been many prominent examples of this, such as DNA origami, where we can take DNA and fold it into a specific pattern. But the major problem with self-assembly is that they can currently only go once. So once I change that structure, I can neither go back nor can I change it to a different structure. But if we're able to create a self-assembling system that's able to continuously change the structure as many times as we would like, then we open up vast new applications, especially in biological systems, where the cellular movements or matrices are usually very dynamic. And we had a clue as to how to start. So two years ago, my research lab discovered that if we have a large, dense solution of neutral particles, such as a cell or a polymer, and two of those particles are spinning in the same direction, then those two particles will come together. And perhaps that would be the key to creating our self-assembling system. And so we created a physics simulation that would allow us to model these spinners for thousands of them at a time. And you can see what it looks like. When there's no spinning, the spinners just look like any other particle. But as soon as we induce the spinning in the same direction, they start to form these large clumps with very arbitrary patterns. So now we know that spinners can indeed form structures. But the question becomes, how can we make an organized structure? Because organization is a basis for creating materials. And you can see here what the organization we're looking for looks like. And it's actually called microphase separation. So the first thing we tried was to oscillate the spinner's direction of rotation in a sine wave pattern, rather than allowing them to continuously spin in the same direction for the entire time. And immediately we saw that the spinner started forming these small finite clusters and separated into consistent distances that's characteristic of a microphase separation. So now that we know this is microphase separation, I also want to note that this method is completely novel. And typically, the method of achieving microphase separation would involve chemically modifying the material structure. And because of this, we now have two major goals concerning the microphase separation structure. The first is to characterize how the properties of microphase separation change as we vary the properties of the spinners. So the most distinctive property of microphase separation is the size of those little clusters. And in terms of the spinner behavior, we can vary two things. We can change the amplitude of the sine wave, which is the maximum rotation speed, as well as the frequency of the wave which is the rate at which they change their directions. And so our first question becomes, how does the average cluster size change as we vary the spinner amplitude and frequency? And for our second question, we asked if we can change the spinner behavior during a single simulation rather than during individual simulations, can we achieve the same average cluster sizes as that from the individual simulations? Because if we can, then we can modify these structures in real time. For our simulation, we use the methods of dissipative particle dynamics, or DPD, which is based on experimental conditions because it uses something called the zero acceleration model. And all this model is, is that every time a particle in our simulation feels a force, there will be an equal and opposite force that goes against it and reduces the acceleration to zero almost instantly. I also want to note that our simulation units are dimensionless, but for our time unit delta t, we run each simulation for 120 delta t per amplitude. 
So this graph here shows the average cluster sizes across individual simulations as we vary the amplitude and frequency. And we can immediately notice that for each distinct frequency, the average cluster size shows similar trends as the amplitude increases. In the beginning, nothing's really happening because there's not enough energy. And then, as we increase the amplitude, the clusters start to form a very high uh, cluster size because there's energy for aggregation, but not as much for breaking apart. Then as we add more energy, the clusters do indeed break apart and form a more stable, smaller cluster size. And finally, for only the smaller frequencies, we can see that at the highest amplitudes, they start to fluctuate very violently. And that's because the simulation has too much energy and has become unstable. So we disregard that as an inaccurate representation of reality. So now that we've seen how average cluster size changes across individual simulations, we're now interested in how they change in the same simulation, because that represents a real-time change. And so to see this, we designed a series of simulations that would involve changing the spinner behavior across certain time units. In the first part, each simulation has a constant amplitude of 2. In the intermediate part, we range them from 4.4 to 7.0. And finally, we return all the amplitudes back to 4.0 for the last part of the simulation. And all of this runs at a constant frequency of 16. And in this graph, you can show, or you can see the results. So we can find three major takeaways from this figure. The first part is that we can indeed smoothly increase the size of the clusters over time. And the second is that we can also do the opposite. We can decrease the size of the clusters over time, although from here we can also see that it takes a much higher difference in amplitude to decrease cluster size, because of course we need more energy to break a cluster than to let more clusters come together. And finally, this figure also shows a very interesting phenomenon. So we have all these intermediate amplitudes with different cluster sizes, and we change them all back to the same amplitude, we would expect that the cluster sizes also go back to the same size produced by the amplitude 4.0. But that's clearly not the case. And the reason for this is that this figure actually shows one of our novel property findings for spinners. And that's a property based on hysteresis, or hysteresis. And but essentially, what's happening is that these spinners have a certain memory of their previous positions that will continuously affect their positions in the future. And that's why, for all of these, even though they should be going to the same value, they're going to different values. Now, the second part of hysteresis is the blocking amplitude. So the minimum amplitude necessary to reset that memory and return it to a normal behavior. And because we see that all the values after 6.0 for the intermediate amplitude return back to the normal behavior, we would say that the intermediate amplitude, that's the blocking amplitude, would be at 6.0. And so in conclusion, we've been able to achieve all of our original goals. So we first show that across individual simulations, the average cluster size follows similar trends as we vary the amplitude across distinct frequencies. Then we see that as we vary the spinner behavior across the same simulation, we can first show that we can smoothly increase cluster size. We can secondly show that we can decrease cluster size as long as we have sufficient energy. And finally, we find a novel spinner property based on hysteresis where the spinners have a memory of their previous positions. And only by going past that blocking frequency of 6.0 can we reset the memory and resume normal behavior. And so all of these findings combined show that the abilities of the spinners will provide an important foundation for future research in self-assembling systems. Because by using them, we can not only achieve organized microphase separation, but we can also vary the structures in real time. And in the future, we would like to further vary our spinner sine waves by using something like a modulated AM wave in order to see whether we can change morphologies as well as the average cluster size. I would like to thank my mentors, Professor Alfredo Alexander Katz and Mr. Ryan Tollefson, my tutor, Ina, 
all of the last three TAs and tutors who were so kind in helping me edit my papers and presentation. And then CE, RSI, and MIT, as well as my sponsors, Ms. Cynthia Pickett-Stevenson, and Admiral, and Ms. Bobby R. Inman. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. I will not to take questions. All right, um, yes. So, so everything you did was, was simulated, right? So, so that leads me to sort of two questions. One is like in practice, how do you actually impart the spins to the particles? And the second question, which maybe is the more important one, is I would imagine that in any real system, you're going to have noise in the spins, in the amplitude and the frequency. And can you address how robust your system might be to the, that noise? Absolutely. So if I understand, the first question is, how can we move this simulation into experimental conditions to force those things to spin? So there's so many different ways to actually force a particle to spin. And actually, the way we develop this simulation is by modeling it after an experiment that we did where we use a magnetic field with ferromagnetic particles to induce spinning. There's a lot of other ways. For example, with uh, something like a photonic crystal, where we're changing the color of it, we use a spin coating or some kind of deposition on there that's externally going to allow us to modify the particle's movements without actually affecting any other physical properties of the simulation. And so does that answer your first question? OK. And then, sorry, could you repeat the second question for me? I I, I would imagine, though, that in any real system, there would be noise in the spins, the amplitude, and the frequency of individual particles. Maybe that's not true for certain physical systems. I don't know. But, but did, you, did you model that in your simulation? We did. So essentially, the two major factors that will cause error, or sorry, let me repeat the question first. Um, they, basically, the question was that there's, go, there's always going to be noise in experimental conditions. And how did I account for that in my research? So the two major factors that are affecting the noise in the spinner movements are the temperature, which will affect the random forces, and also the random coordinates of the spinners when we first begin the simulation. And so actually, when I first did the average cluster size analysis for the individual parts, I actually did do several trials on that, where in each one I modify the random coordinates and what we call the random seed, which is the random forces involved. Now, the thing with random seed is that it only depends on temperature. And our simulation is at a very low temperature, sufficiently enough to cause crystallization of the colloid if it's in equilibrium. So therefore, when I found that, I found that when I changed the random seed, pretty much nothing happened. It's almost identical. So I focused on the noise of random coordinates. And so that's why you can see there are some standard deviation bars here that will slightly affect the um, average cluster sizes. But what I did find from this is that there is a frequency and amplitude range that will produce the most stable results regardless of where I'm starting in the initial coordinates. If you look at frequency 16, that's the green line, if we look at amplitudes between 2 and 4, we can see that the standard deviation is so low it's probably not even visible to you. And it also follows a very smooth curve. And that's actually the reason why I chose the parameters for my simulations where I modify the spinner behavior during a single simulation. Yes? So can you explain why there is such uh, variation in the size of the clusters when you get large clusters, or less variation in the, when you get to the smaller clusters? Yes. So when we have larger clusters, then we also have extended interactions. And one of the characteristics of spinners is that they interact primarily by using the passive particles around them as a medium. And so the larger the cluster sizes are, the longer the range of their interactions, which means they're going to be affecting and pulling around more clusters around them. So when we have a larger cluster size and we have more interactions, that's going to cause more deviations and more fluctuations, which is why you see those deviation bars right there. Oh, and I didn't repeat the question, right? Uh, yeah, the question was, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but uh, the question was, why do the larger cluster sizes here exhibit a higher deviation? And in fact, if we are further interested, I do have a graph in the appendix that demonstrates the, uh, the correlation between the uniformity and the average cluster size. Um, yeah, Evan. Oh, sorry. 
Yeah. In the unstable system, why did you draw those results when I put that in the final way to bring out the two So here's what happened. Oh, and repeat the question before I forget again. Why, did, why do I throw out those unstable results right here? So the easiest answer to this is that it doesn't represent reality, so why should I care? And the reason it doesn't represent reality is that the way the simulation is coded is that every time a particle gets too close to another particle, the repulsive forces will exponentially increase and force them to not overlap. Because in real life, particles can't overlap in, in two dimensions. right? We can't make that happen. But what happens here is that if there's way too much energy, then the energy can actually surpass the repulsive forces in the simulation and force them to overlap. That's going to cause spinners to launch across the simulation, which are basically going to break down the entire simulation and cause the data to be useless. I do want to show it here, though, because it kind of correlates with all the other data at the same amplitude values. OK, um, yes, you. So it looks like all this simulation is done in two dimensions, as well as some of the laboratory work you mentioned earlier. How would you take this to three dimensions? Actually, OK, so the question is, this is done in, the simulation appears to be done in two dimensions, and how would I take that to three dimensions? So the simulation itself is actually not, it doesn't have a dimension at all, it's dimensionless. But it is modeled after a 3D experiment. So I mentioned a little bit before when I was on this appendix figure that our simulations are modeled after an experimental condition. And those conditions are at three dimensions. And the reason we flatten it into one dim or zero dimensions, actually, is because if we use a three-dimension simulation, there's so many more variables involved that it's kind of pointless and, and impractical to study a single property as we're doing right here. But if we do move this back into three dimensions and we're focusing on the property of average cluster size, then it actually will exhibit the same behavior. And there are papers that have shown this. But if we want to talk about a general movement to 3D behavior, then there will be some more things in the code that we would have to add. But it would not affect the results that we have here. OK, um, we have time for one more question. Do any of the mentors or judges have more questions? OK, um, yeah. Um, so are these spinning properties specific to the liquid state of the solution, which are testing high density solutions? And if so, if you're extending it to like materials and solid, solid state materials, then how do you guarantee that when you spin these particles, it won't like, collapse the structure or degrade the properties? So the question was, this appears to be spinning particles in a liquid solution because it is a colloid. And how could I apply this into a solid uh, material in the future? And yes, you are correct. This is meant to be in a very dense colloidal solution. I did mention previously about the temperature of the solution, where it's actually kept low enough to where if we don't induce spinning, then it will crystallize into a solid. The only reason that it is very viscous as a liquid is because we're annealing the structure with the spinners. In terms of how this would apply to solid materials, it technically doesn't, because this is a special colloid solution that's intended only for materials that have rheological properties, so things that move between the solid and liquid states. If we use something of a solid, such as a photonic crystal, which I was talking about previously, then we would induce the spinning in a different method. And we would usually use some kind of coating or structural uh, addition that would help keep the overall structure intact while the uh, actual constituents would be modified, if that makes sense. OK. Um, thank you so much, Jonathan. All right, thank you.